Justin Pearson continues to be pushed as the face of the 2023 Tennessee House of Representatives expulsion case after Justin Jones has now been reinstated and Gloria Johnson was able to remain in her seat. Last week, all three were accused of breaking decorum rules after leading protests for gun reform after the 2023 Covenant school shooting. Pearson has been doing interviews as of late and was recently called out by Tariq Nasheed for his drastic change in his appearance and the way he talks. On Instagram, Nasheed would post, So this guy went from Carlton Banks to rocking an afro and speaking like a fake MLK accent, and we are wrong for having questions about him. Nasheed's critique of Pearson has received a mixed response with some agreeing with Nasheed for questioning Pearson's true motives and others disagreeing with Nasheed's for publicly calling out the former representative. Today we have our company hype analyst Yamanika Saunders and Pierre calling to the studio along with very special guest comedian Shula King to talk all about it and give their thoughts and reactions. But first, let's take a look at this clip. Justin J. Pearson and I'm running for president of BSG. There are a few reasons that we're running this campaign this year. One has to do with representation. How can we represent all voices in a conversation? I wanted to do this by partnering with organizations from the Boone Democrats to the Boone Republicans. I want to bring together different voices, dissenting voices, voices that may be more liberal or more conservative, in order that we can reach a point of sort of the radical middle. Seem like the NRA and gun lobbyists might win. But oh, that was good news for us. I don't know how long this Saturday in the state of Tennessee might last. But oh, we have good news, folks. We've got good news that Sunday always comes. Pierre, I I'm coming straight to you. I, I want to get your reaction, of course, of the clip that we've seen. But also, you know, what are your thoughts and reactions to what Tariq Nasheed is saying about, you know, what he's calling pretty much a code switching that we're seeing? Um... Oh man, Tariq, Tariq. I have, you know, he, he's a toss up when I respect what he says and what he doesn't say. You know, he has a nerve now. Remember, he wrote a book called The Art of Macking, how to, how to mack women and stuff. Now he wants us to listen to how he speaks. Let me explain something to him. He's worrying about code switching. Um, didn't a man named Malcolm X do code switching? Was a pimp at first, and then became one of the biggest advocates for black folks, and we riding with him with Malcolm X. We ain't going back to worrying about him being a pimp. So come on, brother. So the chance is like, look, this young man is trying to do the best he can to get this gun reform um, taken care of because there's so many shootings of black men all over the United States, especially in, you know, in Tennessee with Memphis being wild like that. And why we got to drag him down, this young brother? I don't care what he does. At the end of the day, if he can get stuff passed and look out for us, I'm down with it. We, we shouldn't be nit nitpicking everything somebody does. Why is it we have to constantly nitpick, brother? Come on, Tariq. Come on now. No, 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 no. So I think it's way beyond... He, you know, I'm sure we don't want nobody cold switching, I guess you want to call it. But at the end of the day, we need re re we need um, resolution to stuff. And we need resolution. How do you get it? I'm okay as long as it's resolved. That's all I care about at the end of the day. I don't care what you started from. You could have been a poor person, a drug dealer, whatever. What you're doing today makes a difference to me. Absolutely. Yamanika, let me bring you in. Same, same thing. I want to get your reaction to the video that we're seeing, but also your reaction. Tariq Nasheed is saying, you know, hey, there's a lot of questions because we're seeing and hearing two different voices from the same man. Uh, yeah, I mean, Tariq Nasheed is questionable himself. I mean, I agree with Pierre. And see, sometimes he's hitting the mark. Sometimes he isn't. I think I would have respected his commentary more if he was able to explain uh, or illuminate where um, this young brother is not consistent on his laws and practices versus um, quote unquote code switching. I mean, we understand here as African Americans in this country, oftentimes we code switch so that we can um, participate in environments, right, that are against us. We're all used to like putting on our corporate voices and things of that nature. I would be more interested if Tariq understands the laws in which this young brother has fought for. That's more interesting to me than whether he decided to grow his hair out and start speaking as Malcolm X. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Let me bring in our special guest. First of all, thank you, Shuler, for joining us no, today. No. Mr. Shuler King. No let problem. Me, um, so thank you for joining on this topic, but same question to you. I want to get your reaction, you know, seeing the video, but then also hearing from Tariq Nasheed, you know, about, you know, the difference in appearance in the, in the voice inflictions that we see in here. I mean, all black people code switch. You understand what I'm saying? You're not going to talk to a, a potential employer 
the same way that you would talk to your friends. You right. know what I'm saying? That's that's what we do. We code switch. You know what I mean? If you if you don't believe it, just go pick somebody up from work. You know what I mean? You can catch them walking out. I was like, all right, guys, we'll see you later. Everybody take care. Look look forward to the potluck Wednesday. As soon as they shut the door, like, man, turn the music up, roll it up. You know, whatever it is. Right. You know what I'm saying? That that's how we do that. And I ain't I ain't mad at the brother. If you did whatever you had to do to campaign. He definitely wasn't gonna uh, get that position with the Afro right. talking like Dr. King. He wasn't gonna get it because you got to remember, Dr. King was killed in Tennessee. So we are uh, we already know how they feel about him over there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So. He, was, he definitely wasn't going to get the position talking like that. And I ain't mad at you. If you did what you got to do to get in, and then after that, you like the plan was, I'm going to get in, and I ain't going to get a haircut no more, and then I'm going to start, I'm going to talk how I really talk. Hey, hey bro, if, if that's how you got to get in because they code switch with us. Right. You know what I'm saying? It, it, every Ooh, so often you run into somebody who's just real cool with the crew, and they, hey, what's up, bro? How y'all doing? And then when they get around their family or their friends, they're not talking like that. Yeah, and I, and I think you you all hit it, uh, you know, the nail on the head. There are so many other things that are so much more important than what he sounds like. Um, Yamanika, I want to come back to you because, you know, focusing on what feels like, like the outward <laughs> uh, appearance, right? The way he sounds, the way he looks, his hair growing. Do you think Tariq Nasheed using his platform to call him out as opposed to having a conversation with the young brother, especially because Tariq Nasheed is supposed to be, you know, wants to be known as a black leader in the community. Do you think it's non-progressive behavior of what we're seeing from Tariq Nasheed to call him out, you know, on his on his platform? I'll just give an abbreviated, right? It comes off to me as a quote unquote hater vibes from Tariq, right? Because he does want some sort of political standing in our community and seen as a leader. And this is a young guy that sort of come out of nowhere and has sort of surpassed the status that he has. I'm not, a, my biggest problem with our community, and this is something that we also get talked about for on Comedy Hype, because they're always saying, we always trying to cut black people down in need. We can't be helping, you know, all this nonsense, is that. Tariq does this a lot as well. And I never see him really challenging any white politicians. You know, we always quit to like cut each other down and throw each other under the bus. But I mean, let the young brother do what you do. It's about him too, but it's not about his hair. And it's not about the way he speaks. It's about what were your standings? What were your platforms for you to get in position there? Especially in a place like Tennessee. We do have to, like Mr. Hill said, we have to be very careful because it's not like Tennessee is a place where black people are just roaming free. For him to get in position of leadership there, this is also a time right. I ask you guys to look at a book called Black Like Me. It was one of the books I read when I was younger. Uh, uh, it, it annals a uh, white man going through the process of darkening his skin to live the black experience. And only then did he really understand what it meant to be black. So the last thing we need is black people who are already black, not understanding what it means to be black in certain arenas and having to, to talk a certain way, look a certain way so that we can advance. Pierre, let me bring you in. Same question for you. You know, what are your thoughts seeing, you know, what we're seeing from Tariq Nasheed? Do you think this is non-progressive behavior for the things that we know we need as a community? Well, I know Tariq is passionate about black people and about black people being successful. I get that. But sometimes you can be overly, uh, you know, trying to prove a point. There's a thing called growth. We all go through growth. We should go through growth. People who joined the Nation of Islam didn't start off all the time a, a, a Muslim from birth. People who joined certain situations and have certain push didn't start off that way. It's a growth period. That young man, when he was speaking what we call properly, maybe, you know, maybe gun reform wasn't a major issue for him right then at that time. And then as he got into office, he started to realize, hold on, man, you know, I'm seeing more than I realized outside when I was running, that now I need to change my whole persona, you know, because that's why I, I got to fight this way to get certain things done. At the end of the day, if he's trying to get certain things done, why aren't we supporting, especially when it's positive towards black, like gun reform in a place, anywhere, any city, but especially, like I said, in Tennessee. Why are we totally supporting this brother? Are we why are we worried nitpicking again about what his past was? He didn't come in speaking for you know hood or whatever with the afro. Why do we it's called growth at the end of the day? We all should uh, 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 applaud growth, especially if it's something positive towards the you know the black community. 
Yeah, uh, Sheila or King, let me bring you in on this as well. And I, I think Pierre makes a great point. We know Tariq Nasheed to have this strong desire for black people. So his intentions could definitely be in a good place. But the actions that we're seeing, right, of, you know, taking a big platform that he has on Instagram to, you know, call this gentleman out based on just appearance. I, do, I am about holding people accountable, but just based on appearance. Mm -hmm. So same question to you. Do you think what we're seeing can be considered non-progressive behavior for our community? Um. Anytime you have a group of people fighting amongst each other when they already have common threats to their own progression and not taking on those common threats, it's, it's non-progressive. Mm. Anytime you have one person, you know, nitpicking with this other person, it's like if, if, it's, if, if there's three people stuck in a jar or whatever, you know, and there's one person attacking the two. And instead of saying, hey, let's attack this person who's attacking us or attack this issue that's attacking us, we are attacking each other and not attacking the issue. Mm. I don't care what, what, whether you got Afro, dreadlocks, whatever the case it is. Like, you know, it's just like Pierre said, we all, you know, have things where we, we've changed, we've grown. We don't have time to be nitpicking about stuff. We all got, we got too many issues as a community to be digging at each other about stuff as petty as how you enunciate, <laughs> right. you know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't make any sense. So yes, it's non-progressive behavior to me. Right, and I, and I think too, um, again, I'm big on holding people accountable. There are a lot of people that are wondering, you know, where both of these gentlemen um, come from and, you know, just different things. People have questions. Um, and someone or in a recent interview that Justin Pierce actually did on The Breakfast Club with um, Teslin, she was a, a guest interviewer on the show as well, did an interview and she's getting a lot of backlash. So I want to take a look at this clip and then come back and add in more to this conversation. Let's take a look. Where was Representative Freeman on the floor? That He's is, a Democrat, right? He is a Democrat. That is a good why, why is he? Why was he not on the floor? I believe on that day he was actually excused. But the question that the point that another point that I think you're making is how do we build more solidarity with people who uh, no, that's not the point how I'm we making. believe tell me about your black policy. Well, you know, not about everybody and help everybody. Do you support reparations? Some people said you didn't and then others said you did. Like, give us a quick rundown specifically on black people that yeah. you represent in your district. When you do for black folk, everybody does benefit. Yeah, we know, but right? I'm gonna ask you and about so, the black policy. So I am. I you know about your policy. My you policy. Yeah. Yeah. What's the, exactly. What's your policy? Black when you think about so reparations, I'm 100 percent for reparations for cash, for credit, for check, for credit card, <laughs> for, for trust okay. fund. We, what about reparations for all of these harms that we have experienced? All now, the way are up you to the willing to put day? it? On, are you willing to put it on your website though? Because it's it's not under your website on issues. Now, as I mentioned, um, Tesla is getting a, a lot of backlash because of this interview that she did on The Breakfast Club. A lot of people claiming that she went too hard on him. She was grilling him too hard. He's only 28 years old. He's only been in his position for a couple of months. Um, so, Pierre, I'm going to come to you first. I want to get your reaction. And do you think it's fair, the, the backlash that we're seeing Tesla receive from this interview? All right, let me put something first I want to talk about. That young brother, like, like I, I've gone to Baptist church. I grew up in a Baptist church. I've talked to my preacher on regular time, and then I've seen him preach. There's two different people. That brother spoke the same way he spoke when he was walking down that thing in that school as he does. Everybody doesn't say, yes, I'm this now. Oh, the diamond. If, you, if you're in Congress and you want to speak a different way, you put a little inflection, no different than a pastor when he's on the pulpit, speaks different than normal. So he didn't do no cold switching and all that changing. He spoke the same way. Sitting down, he's, he's speaking. He's not in Congress at that point. You get what I'm saying? So let's get off that young brother for one time he spoke properly. He spoke properly just then, sitting down with them at the breakfast club. Okay, so let's let's leave that and let's be careful with all this negativity toward these young men and these pe young uh, people, men and women, trying to change the world. Um, um, don't make them afraid to join to become leaders because they didn't grow up in the hood. Maybe someone grew up around white folks with a white college. Don't get to the point where they're afraid to say, "Let me start speaking for black folks." But guess what? I went to an all white college. I grew up in an all white neighborhood. Now I'm afraid to go say something because they might go backwards to my. You know, growing up in the fifth grade, I was hanging around white kids. Now you don't want me to speak for black people. Be very careful. And this young lady who spoke on his brother, yeah, she put some heat on him. You know, yeah, she might want to have a point, you know, get a point across. But she was like, he was, she was like, like interrogating this young man instead of speaking to the young man. You know what I'm saying? To me, it felt like an interrogation. And these young brother, this young man is trying to do the best he can for certain things. So I think she went about it the wrong way. And that's why she's receiving all this backlash. You know what I'm saying? You know, some, you know, she just cut him off, spoke above him 
and pushed him around. So, yeah, I think it was more of an interrogation than a real interview. And I think she had an agenda. So let me ask you this, Pierre, and then Yamini, I'm coming to you next. Um, let me ask you this, Pierre. Do you, why do you think so many people have, you know, these questions? Because, you know, we've had experiences where moles have been planted in our, in our communities. We've seen different things. Why do you people think people have that fear, black people specifically, have a fear, you know, when we see black leaders or see, you know, black people in these positions to where we, we're not just easily, you know, here with arms open? Um, I go to the grocery store every day. I go to the movies. I go out to clubs every day and I see shootings every day. But you know what? I don't live in fear. Why do we have to live in fear? Why? Life is what it is. Okay, there's some moles. There might be some moles here and there, but we're gonna not. We're gonna get rid of all the people because we worry about a few moles. Are we gonna, not, you know, you know, be so hard on every person that comes through our channel and stuff because we're worried about moles and stuff like that? Is that what we really gonna do? Well, you're gonna squash the uh, for young people who want to be in politics if they feel like they're gonna be yelled at, you know, ostracized, all that kind of stuff. You know, they might say, "Man, I ain't getting in politics. I ain't about to help nothing, man." Anyway, they get on us and stuff like that. So, yeah, do we have have we had moles? Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that ain't gonna change. But, you know, I think we need more people in, in, in positions to help us out than to worry about who's a mole and who's not a mole. So tough. Yeah, Monica, let me bring you in. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, as far as my, my views, you know, I'm, I'm big on holding people accountable, especially when it comes to politicians and people in position. Um, but let me ask you, Yamanika, and I want to get your reaction, but also, do you think there needs to be some type of code or some type of process, you know, that we put in place to, to when we have a black leader, there's a protocol that we that we have in place for that? So I think people are going to have a problem with her because we normally have a problem, especially black women, um, you know, challenging or having opinions about things, especially in this culture. Tariq, she can have his opinions and people will like it. And then we'll talk about this woman and say that she was too hard on him. I don't think she was too hard on him. I think she was asking him questions about Representative Freeman, who was not there, but is someone that he works with. And I think she was asking direct questions that were very important as to why there seems to be no accountability when we talk about white Democrats who are in a space with Democrats of color. I agree with everything that she asked him. She asked very specific questions. My thing is, we have to also remember, this is, when we talk about gun control, not just an issue of color. This is a issue that is happening in America because we are seeing mass shootings happening everywhere. We just had one the other day in Louisiana. I mean, this is constantly happening in the school. So, you know, we need to focus in on what these brothers are talking about. And remember, they're not talking about reparations right now. What they're talking about is gun control. And the other thing I'll add in the end is I guarantee you most of the black people that have opinions about him right now had no fucking idea who he was, right? Until just now. And that's our, also our other... We show all representatives that are in our communities across the country, and we should know what they stand for. We are not educated enough politically, and this is why we also have disadvantages. Yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely appreciate you um, for you giving your your perspective, and I don't think you're the only one that feels that way on the um, on today. But let me bring in Sheila King. Um, I love to get your thoughts on this as well. You know. Tesla is getting a lot of backlash because of how she conducted the interview. Mm -hmm. I'd love to know your thoughts. Uh, do you think it's fair for the backlash that we're, we're seeing her? And why do you think so many people, you know, have this uh, appreh apprehension about uh, Mr. Justin? Um, I think both of the people that criticized the young man, uh, they, they did the same exact thing. And there's one word that, that we as a community need to practice when it comes to a lot of things. And that word is discretion. You understand? There's nothing wrong with criticizing somebody. There's nothing wrong with calling somebody to the rug. There's nothing wrong with checking to make sure that somebody is who they say they are when they've been selected somehow as a voice of this community. But out in public, as soon as they, you know, as soon as they're brought out, you know, now all of a sudden you want to dogpile them. And I'm not picking either or. It's just an act of discretion. 
you know, if you really want to know who he is, then you need to sit down and you need to have a conversation with this man and you need to do your own research and do your own digging. You start asking him questions out in public knowing that he's unprepared about certain things. It's easy to hurl questions at somebody and say, well, who are you? Mm -hmm. What are you stand for? And where are you coming from? And all this other kind of stuff. Nobody else does that. If somebody else is brought forth into the light and saying, hey, this young man is a representative for us, well, then there will be certain people who are in that arena to start checking folks out and start saying, all right, well, let me ask you a couple of questions. I need to see who you are and what do you stand for? Are you really who you say you are? But when you don't, when you do it out in public and you don't practice discretion, then it shows, it, it makes all of us look unorganized mm -hmm. and it makes us look like, oh, but that, that whole thing is just a mess. When we're out here fighting amongst each other, just if he's out there, okay, we, you, we, we gonna, we gonna say that you can be out there. But when the camera turns off, I got, come here, I got some questions for you. Mm -hmm. And that's how you do that. Everybody else learns discretion. We need to have discretion. Nothing wrong with what you're doing. Right yeah. thing, wrong time, wrong place. Yeah, I have can to I, say, Can I, I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Yamanika. And then Pierre, I'm gonna come to you next. I just, yeah, I, d I just wanna ask because I know we keep talking about, uh, you know, I'll just go off of the word discretion and him not being prepared and him not knowing. I want everybody to remember he ran for office. He is a politician. He is supposed to be prepared for all the information that he gives and he should know what he's running for. I don't, I don't think that uh, that is a qualifier for her to have to ask him softballing questions because he may or, might, may or not be prepared for this position. I mean, we have to remember that he ran for office. So with that information that I just presented, what is the counter uh, to that? Either Pierre or Mr. Hill can answer that. I'll, I'll counter that. I'll counter that. She had an agenda on one thing. Basically, one of the major things was reparation. He was explaining to her about other things, elderly, pollution. He was maybe saying, hey, in my district, I'm working on these things right now that is affecting my community right now. Reparation is not affecting them right now. Homelessness, food, you know, gun control, old people, you know, having, you know, enough money to live and survive for the rest of their life. You know what I'm saying? So if you're saying reparations, is just to the old people. So I think he, because reparations is going to be a long-term situation. Let's be honest. It's going to take a minute to get that done. But I think he was focusing on, okay, I'm down for reparation, but right now my community needs this right now, clean water or clean whatever the situation was. I think that's what he was saying. He was, and she was wanting to know, what about reparations? Okay, I, I'm down with reparations, but right now, my people need this right now. So, so. Yeah, and I, and I do want to chime in here because uh, I, I, I disagree with both the gentlemen. I agree with Yamanika. I think as someone who watched the interview in totality, um, I think she did a phenomenal job of asking questions that she was hearing from the people. So for that particular question, when she asked about reparations, the reason why she did ask is because a lot of people were saying, and she mentioned in the interview, she said some people are saying you're for reparations, some people are saying you're against it. What is your black policy and how do you feel about it just so it can be straight and narrow? In the beginning of the interview, she actually cleared up to really give people an understanding of what happened that day. So I think what I saw in the interview was, yes, hold his feet to the fire. But and I, I don't think that she did the same. Like, I would have to disagree. I don't think she did the same way that Tariq Nasheed did, because Tariq Nasheed is just talking about the way that he looks and the way that he mm -hmm. talks, as opposed to her. She's asking about what is your black policy on mm -hmm. when when she went to his website, mm -hmm. there was nothing mentioned on his website about black and, you know, black and brown people. And I actually, you know, did my own research. The only thing when he did mention black and brown communities specifically on his website was when it came to prison reform. But all his other policy did not mention black. And we've had this conversation before about what black people need. Mention black people. Don't put us with minorities because that includes, you know, white women and these things. We're talking about the black cause. So personally, for me, I feel like it's needed for us to have these conversations. As Yamanika said, if you take the time and you think that you're ready to run for office, then you have to be ready for these hard hitting questions. And I do believe it should be on a big platform because that's the only way for our people to understand hey, okay, I can't directly ask this, this person this question, so mm -hmm. I need the interviewer to ask these hard-hitting questions so I know when I'm voting for someone or I know when I'm standing for someone exactly what they're standing for. They're not afraid to say it yeah. on a big platform. Can I, uh, yeah, no, can please, I go please ahead. respond to that? Please. And, I, and I, uh, I understand why you disagree with that, but um, 
And I and I you know is there's a certain degree. I don't agree with what Tariq did. Yeah. You know, I I really don't, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and my only thing I actually agree with what the the young lady was doing with asking him the questions. I was just saying that in the way it kind of just came out like, you know, the on, who are you? You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. who are you and I'm and grilling you. That's all. And 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 yeah. speaking as somebody who has had family members in politics, I can say now when you get into politics, you cannot say I'm doing this for my white people. Right. I'm doing this for my black people. Right. You have to do code switch. You have to use euphemisms unless the power structure, unless the power structure says, hey, we need to stop the Jewish hate. We need to stop the Asian hate. And then you get upset and say, well, wait a minute. What about the black people who do X, Y, and Z? Or what about that we've been victimized by X, Y, and Z? That's, you know, you can speak up when, uh -huh. we, when you start talking about specific groups. Okay, then we can do that. But if we're talking about in general, when you start talking about certain things, you can't get up there. You're not going to get anywhere as a black person mm -hmm. in politics because the power structure. For local, the power, are we speaking yeah, local? No, no, or? I'm talking about in general. Mm -hmm. the, the, the power structure of politics mm -hmm. in America is white owned. Yeah. Okay. So when you walk in there and say, yeah. I'm doing this for black people, and they're going to be like, all right, well, yeah. they're going to say, well, good luck. Right. And you I understand that. Saying? I think, but yeah. for, for him, you know, most of his district, 60% is black people, right? right. Absolutely. So when we see, and, and again, this is her asking the question so that, yeah. you know, and I think that right. would have been a great response for him to right. say, yeah. you know, hey, there are certain ways that I have to, you know, right. and I don't know if he can even say that on the platform. Which but, is why I was talking about discretion. That's why, when, when I said discretion, right. that's what I was certain talking things about. Like yeah. But Symphony said she want to hear him say black, not minorities, but black. They're no, not but that, that. No, well, wait a minute. Okay, but also we're not gonna pile dog down on Symphony either. What I'm gonna say is that no, I get no, I get it. But what I'm saying, Symphony said more than that. But what I'm gonna say, but that was one of the things she said. We can't do that, right? Right. Hold on. Let Let's let Yamanika finish. But at the end of the day, right? All of this code switching, all of this discretion you guys are asking for, all of this, make sure we don't say anything that ruffles the feathers of white people, is because we don't have any social and economic power. That starts with us. So we are going to consistently have these conversations because we don't affect change anywhere. When I talk about these things on the platform, the first thing I get aligned with is being a Candace Owen or Uncle Tom or Angie Mama. I grew up in a white environment. I went to a white school. I'm just some Angie Bama black bitch running her mouth. And I'm telling you, we do not, number one, stick together. Number two, there's no form of discretion. We are completely against each other and we have no political power. So at this point, we're just doing the best we can just to survive. Absolutely. And we're, and we're going to open up. We're going to open it up for an uh, audience member. But I do want to say one more thing. The producer is telling me go, go to the audience. But I do want to say thing, one thing, Pierre, I wasn't saying specifically for me. I want to see black in these policy. What I said was she asked the question about what is your black policy? Because when she goes onto his website, the only time she saw black and brown communities listed on his website was under prison reform. So that is why she asked specifically about the black policy and the reparations. And let's saying, not forget, she asked about she asked about Representative Freeman first. He dodged mm -hmm. and, ste and stepped all around that question. That question was specifically about gun reform, which is what they were protesting. He didn't directly answer that question, and he gave a lot of wool tickets for the guy not being on the floor. That was the original question that she asked. So then she got into his politics regarding his community that he represents, which is disproportionately African-American, that is not showing any signs of him representing the African-American community of there. Well, as you know, every Wednesday we have a live studio audience and we have the opportunity to have an audience member come on to the show to ask you all a question. So today we have Dacovius, who is a barber and a comic out, out here in Atlanta, Georgia. So I'm going to kick it over to him. Thank you for joining us. And what's your question? For Shula and the panel, I just wanted to know who is a black community leader that you feel like actually got it right? I don't think that you can you can't pick out one person mm. that got it all right. You know mm. what I mean? There were great things about Malcolm. There were great things about uh, Martin. There were great things about Marcus Garvey. You know what I mean? And no, there is no leader that that gets it all right. Mm. You know, they're, they're, you can pick out greatness and you can pick out flaws in anybody you know what i mean so there's there's no such thing